Welcome to the August 2023 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. In this episode, Shannon Combs Bennett is back to give us the latest rundown on the various available DNA testing options. Then author Charlotte Barnes will be here and she has some fantastic ideas for creative ways to share family history with the kids in your family. You are not going to want to miss this interview. And then we're going to wrap things up at the editor's desk with the editor of Family Tree Magazine, Andrew Cook, to hear what we can look forward to in the next issue of the magazine and some of his top tips for working with family trees. As always, we have a lot to cover, so let's get to it. First up is Tree Talk. Rachel Christian is the social media editor here at Family Tree Magazine, and that makes her the perfect person to find out what's trending in the world of genealogy. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Lisa. Today, I want to talk about a brand new website for searching naturalization records. It's called nynaturalizations.com, and it has only come online within the past month, I would say. And it is a free portal to thousands of naturalization records that date from 1795 to 1952. These records include declaration of intention, petitions for naturalization, certificates of naturalization, and more. Uh, These can be game changers because these documents can contain birthplaces, ports of entry, and other really crucial information for people researching their immigrant ancestors. To clarify, these are naturalization records from Queens and the Bronx. So, as always, there will be a link in the description below, and we encourage our listeners to check it out if that sounds like it'd be a good resource for you. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight our weekly newsletter. Some of our listeners may already be subscribed, but if not, uh, we send out a weekly newsletter on Thursdays called the Genealogy Insider, and it has a section on genealogy news where, on a weekly basis, we recap new features, new tools, and new websites like these. Um, So if you're not already subscribed, you can head to familytreemagazine.com backslash genealogy insider newsletter, uh, or visit a link in the show notes to go and sign up. Terrific. Gosh, we always love to hear about new records coming online. The Genealogy Insider Newsletter is a great way to stay on top of that. I know you stay on top of all those new launches. So Thank you so much for sharing. We'll talk to you next month. Sounds good. Thanks, Lisa. At FamilyTreeMagazine.com, author Shannon Combs Bennett has been guiding readers through the world of genealogy and DNA. And part of that exploration has been to evaluate the various available DNA testing options. And the good news is she's here today to tell us more about that. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy you could come back and kind of give us an update on DNA and genealogy. And I know in your article, um, in fact, you've written several, you've been kind of introducing readers to the five different DNA tests that are currently on the market. And you said that you have personally taken all five tests in your I quest have. to review them. <laughs> That's a lot of swabbing, Shannon. <laughs> it It is. A family and friends come along with the journey, too. So it's not just me. <laughs> Yeah. Is it still long enough around Yeah, me? the more the better, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Here, spit in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a way to break the ice in a conversation. That's right. Um, so what are the five DNA companies, the testing companies right now that you're focused on? So uh, here in the U.S., those tend to be, there's the big ones, which are um, Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, um, My Heritage, Twenty Three and Me, and um, Living DNA being the fifth. Yep, I've taken all five of them, and it's been fun. Interesting. Do they all test the same way? Is it all swabbing? Is it all spitting? Does that vary? It varies from company to company. Some of them are spit tests where, you know, you have to fill it with saliva up to a certain line. And then some of them are cheek swabs. Um, And I will say that it's important for some people to determine spit versus swabbing, especially the older you get or if you're on certain types of medication. So if you have like dry mouth or you can't like get a lot of spit because it it actually gets really difficult. Some of my older family members 
they were they can't take some of those um, the saliva tests. We have to use the swab tests on them only because you they just don't have it. Wow, that's a yeah, that's a really good point. That's a good, good thing to consider. Well, let's go back to the beginning then. So, about when did DNA testing first come out for genealogy? So the the rule of thumb is most people consider it about the year two thousand because that's really when uh, it kind of kind of sprung out on the market with Bennett Greenspan and Family Tree DNA, um, really for consumer uh, the consumer market you know direct to to home. There had been some like with Sorensen and blood tests and things like that at like conferences and things before that. But really with, you know, come take a, take a spit test. Let's find out who you are really started now, almost 23 years ago. (laughs) What do you see as some of the biggest changes that have happened over these last 20 years? Uh, Really more and more people taking it. It used to be really just like diehard genealogists. Because let's be honest, who right. who really would have started out? Who who would have thought, right? And then it kind of came to well, uh, people who didn't know where they came from, so adoptees or people who, estranged from their families, didn't know backgrounds, and then it kind of developed into the well, I have a family story, or really curious. Well, I wonder if I'm. XYZ ethnicity, right? So it's kind of been ebbing and flowing, but over the years, you know, it's now it's it's Christmas presents. <laughs> it went yeah. from diehard, yeah, diehard genealogist to um I just came back from visiting family in Indiana last week. And even the people who, you know, 10 years ago were, oh, the genealogists of the family are talking and they were like, yeah, my kids got me DNA tests and this is so cool. And I'm like, really? Okay. (laughs) The people who weren't at all interested 10 years ago are now taking DNA tests? Really? All right. (laughs) It's amazing. It's very mainstream now. I would imagine yeah. that all those ancestry uh, DNA commercials probably helped a lot with that, don't you think? I think it did because it normalized it. You know, it was now not the old aunt or uncle off in the library researching the family history, you know, the eccentric person in the family. It's now anybody has access to that information. Anybody who's curious about their family can go off and do it. You don't have to be retired. You can you can be young, you can be old, you can be middle-aged, you can be anybody. Anybody can access their family history yeah. now. It's wonderful. It is. Well, I would imagine another thing that has changed a lot over the years are the various tools that these different companies have. And I know that they do vary a lot between their different tools. So was that a lot of the criteria that you were looking at as you were reviewing each of these companies and kind of doing those comparisons? Yeah, I mean, well, when DNA testing first started, it really was, and I still get this question a lot, especially from um, older members of our community who remember when DNA testing started and it was just for men, it was just Y chromosome testing. And now the most popular and cheapest test is autosomal testing, which anybody can take. Um, so autosomal testing and it's majority of the time, less than a hundred dollars. Some, most of the time, less than, you know, $50 when you get it on sale. Um, and you can take Y chromosome testing and mitochondrial DNA testing, all different types. You can take, you know, find a little bit of information. And if you have money burning holes in your pocket, you can spend a little bit extra and test for a little bit more. Um, but there's all the different tools. There's, you know, different types of third-party tools that you can then download your data from these companies and learn um, how to map your chromosome and how to match information to other people better and analyze it more. Really, really get your hands like in 
dirty. I don't like, you really get your hands into the nitty gritty information <laughs> and the parts and get into it, you know, not just go, yes, and I belong to this part of the, of the world and I have ancestry from this area, but you can really start to see where the bits and pieces of your DNA came from and, and how you inherited it from different people. Um, kind of like the, like your big mosaic, you know, you can actually see how you and your cousins fit together in that big puzzle. So what do you think are the most important factors to consider when we're choosing between these five companies? So for me, I kind of think it depends on what you want to know. If you're, if you're just curious, just, it just, I don't really have a question to answer. Like I, I'm not, a, I'm not adopted. I'm not um, the burning desire to know something specific. I'm just kind of curious. You can really test anywhere. For people who are adopted or have a specific question, I encourage them to test at the larger database or the larger companies first. So that would be like Ancestry because they do have the largest number of testers. So you're going to get the most amount out of it. You're going to most likely find a relative first there. If you're into more health information, 23andMe still has a lot more of the health factors and you can participate in those types of questionnaires in addition to the genealogy. So if you want a little bit of a twofer, you can still go that way a little bit more. Um, Family Tree DNA is still the only company out there that has Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA for matching. So if you want to match somebody or find relatives with your Y or mitochondrial, you'll still have to test there. Um, if you're interested in like your definite British Isle roots, living DNA is the, is the place to go to. Um, what is nice though is, except for Ancestry, you can download your results and upload them to different companies. You can't upload results to Ancestry. They're the only one. So if you're pinching pennies and money conscious, I tested Ancestry, download from Ancestry and upload to the other places. <laughs> kind of, it kind of, you know, get the, the money's worth that way. Um, but, you know, perhaps that's part of their pricing strategy. <laughs> it could be. You know, really could or be. That, that strategy <laughs> of not allowing people to, to upload. Yeah. Yeah, but they each have their own little, like they each have their own tools. So it's really important, I think, um, because they each are unique with with the types of tools they have. My Heritage has the way they sort and cluster. They have a clustering tool that's really unique to them. Gosh, it's it's getting harder and harder to find that one thing that is unique about them as the years go on. <laughs> it becomes more apples and oranges, doesn't it? You mentioned something really critical, which is the size of the database. I think a lot of people who really aren't into the, the whole technology, they just, like you said, are curious. Um, they may not realize there is quite a difference between how many people have tested each company and that that impacts the total number by which you're matching to that you're that they're being able to pull data from in order to tell you more about what your results mean, and um, I I think you know you mentioned my heritage, uh, and I think probably ancestry too. If you want to see the the visual the story of your DNA, uh, would you agree that maybe those two are really tools that are going to give you a lot of bang for your buck after you do the test? to be able to see that story and see that past heritage on a map where these people might've come from. Yes. Yeah. The larger ones will definitely be able to give you that type of information because when you have the larger databases and the larger amount of people, I mean, obviously there's more information to draw from. There's more people to compare yourself to. Um, you'll be able to find more relatives, even more distant relatives. So they'll be able to give you more information. Um, it's not to say that the smaller companies and the smaller databases don't have information. They do. There are people there. 
Um, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just going to be different. It's going to be a different outcome. Am I correct that 23andMe doesn't have you upload your family tree? So that would be a pretty distinguishing factor between if you're really interested in the family history, family tree side of it, to upload with a company that's focused on genealogy versus one that's not. True. Very true. They used to. And you can connect. Um, So, for example, my information out there, I have connected and, and I like my parents are out there and I'm out there and I have been able to connect with other family members. So it does show that we are connected, but it's not in what we would think of as a traditional family tree network, but it does show a family connection. Well, and my last question would be if price or cost isn't really the big determining factor, do you think it's worthwhile? Should a genealogist be testing with all the companies if they're possible, or at least testing with one and uploading to all the others? So of course I do. (laughs) (laughs) Of course you do. Of course I do. Yeah. Um, And, and I have to say, and the reason I do, and I don't just say that because I do have a biology background and I'm a genealogist, but I do because I think one, you never know where a family member is going to test. So if you're trying to connect with family And you're trying to connect with as many different family members that you've maybe have lost contact with over the years. Um, You never know who's going to get a present from someone or or win a door prize at a genealogy conference. Or, you know, I was at a conference last week in Indiana and they had kits from two different companies. So it depended on which door prize you won if you got an ancestry or my heritage kit. Well, if I only tested at Ancestry, I was going to lose 50% of that room. <laughs> um, oh, right. Right? So, I, I mean, I would test at everyone because then I have more tools at my disposal because they each have different analysis tools. I have a greater chance of finding ancestors. Plus, they also analyze your DNA different ways. They test different parts. They, they use different chips to analyze the DNA. They're each proprietary. Um, If people are really big geeks like I am, they can go out and read the white papers from each company on how they process the information. Um, And it's each proprietary, so they do it slightly different. So it's slightly different information. So you're learning different things about your DNA, your family background, your ethnicities, and your heritage just by testing a different company bigger picture. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and everybody listening can learn more about this bigger picture over at familytreemagazine.com. Uh, you'll find Shannon's article, DNA Test Reviews, Ancestry DNA, My Heritage DNA, and more. And that's constantly being updated on the website. And also in the main menu, look for DNA plus heritage. Shannon Combs Bennett, it is always nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for guiding us through the world of DNA. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. In today's Family History Home segment, let's take a look at the next generation. What can we do to encourage the younger generations in our family to be interested in genealogy research? Well, here to share her ideas is Charlotte Barnes of the Turning Little Hearts blog. Welcome to the show, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for all you're doing to help people get excited about and learn about family history. Well, you know, getting our kids and our grandkids interested in genealogy is kind of a challenge for us. And I know it matters to so many of us because we all want the work that we've done to continue on and to strengthen and right. support our descendants. I know you you talk a lot on this subject. We're going to get some specific ideas from you. Why do you think it's important for people to share and be able to figure out creative ways to share their family history with their kids? Well, you actually just said it a few moments ago. You mentioned strengthening the next generation, the future generations. That is my whole thing. My husband, Jonah, and I, we have written a couple books about family history for children And we love helping people, first of all, well, people who don't really care about family history, we love telling them why 
learning about your family history and sharing your ancestor stories is such a great parenting and grandparenting tool that it helps children become more resilient. It helps them find identity and belonging and a unique, just a unique source of strength that can't be found anywhere else um, and perspective and insights and strength. So, um, and then we also love talking to people who already agree that uh, they already know family history is so incredible and want help you know, turning the hearts of, of their younger generations towards their ancestors so they can experience that same strength and insight and beauty of learning about their ancestors. So it's so important because of how it, how it can help your future generation. I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of research into this and, and kids feel connected and they feel like, um, you know, they're a part of something bigger with their with their extended family. So, so many benefits, emotional and otherwise. And so I'd love to have you share with us a couple of the ideas of what are some tangible ways that we could actually share what we've been finding in our own genealogy research with, let's say, the kids so that they would be interested. Awesome. Well, my first tip is called find the golden nugget in every story that you can turn into an activity. So find the golden nugget. So you all know so many amazing stories about your ancestors and hidden in each of those stories or not so hidden is a little golden nugget that you can use to turn that story into a fun activity for younger generations. For example, if you had an ancestor who was a paperboy or if you yourself earn money as you were growing up delivering papers, well, lots of younger kids don't even know what a newspaper is. <laughs> and so you can get a newspaper and practice riding your bike down the street. You know, the kids can ride their bike down the street and throw the newspaper and try and aim for, you know, doorsteps. Or of course, if your neighbors aren't okay with that, just go by your house several times. But, um, but that is taking a story and a little nugget and turning it into an activity. And so if you can make an activity around a story, it's much more real, it's much more tangible, it's much more memorable. And what's fun is that you can take pictures of these activities and make a little photo book. And you can have like side by side a picture of when this ancestor was a paper boy and then a picture of your grandchild pretending to be a paper boy. And side by side, you can link them and then they can have this little memory book to remember their ancestors and when they connected with them and did these fun activities. So that's just a small example of one little story and taking one little nugget from it, make an activity. Another thing you can do um, is just make things as visual as possible. Nowadays, kids, adults even, like we are just bombarded with videos and pictures and we thrive with that. That's such a powerful way that we learn. In fact, if we're just told a story, sometimes it's not as interesting because, you know, we expect pictures to be with it. So um, when my mother came to town a, a couple months ago, she uh, told us a story about when she worked at the World's Fair in New York City. And I had heard these stories before, but I thought, I, you know what, this is 2023. I can contextualize this story that she's sharing. So I simply went on Google and I found all these pictures of the World Fair, World's Fair in New York when she worked there. And I made this PowerPoint with the with these pictures and shared it with the kids while she was telling the stories. And so the stories just it just transformed. Even for me, who's heard these stories before, I was able to see real photographs, not from her, because she didn't have pictures but photographs just that I found on Google, putting her story in context. So that's a huge blessing that we have nowadays is that when we tell ancestor stories, we can easily find photographs, paintings that put these stories in context. Even if it's not a picture of that precise ancestor, we can do a wonders to you know make it real. So that's something that I suggest is when you're telling stories, if you don't have pictures, find similar pictures online. Absolutely. Things that are representative of it or that or somebody else took. That makes sense. I love yeah. that the activities you're describing include multiple generations. You know, you're getting the pictures together. Your mom's telling the story. But after the activity, you also can create mementos out of the learning moments. And that just sounds yeah. like a double treat. Well, speaking of making those mementos, one of my favorite things to do with my kids is when I tell 
a quick little story. I'll give them a piece of paper and pencils and markers, and they'll draw this, they'll illustrate the story themselves. Uh, and then I type out a caption, and then I put all the stories into a book. So I have illustrated family stories so that they, you know, they have ownership over these stories because they've made the illustrations, and then they can go back and read them. Um, something else that I love to do is that we have ancestors who have uh, certain mottos, things that live by, like, plan, simplify, and be strong, or um, happiness is a choice. And these are incredible mottos that guided these lives of our ancestors. And so I love sharing these mottos with my kids. And I've had them make little placards that they've hung up in their rooms. So we've tried to bring those powerful messages into our family. Something else that's fun is when you're going through pictures, if you find pictures of multiple, like of different ancestors doing similar things, like ancestor A was a sheep farmer, ancestor B was a dairy farmer, put the pictures side by side and, and you know, compare things visually and say like, which would you rather do? Would you rather be a sheep farmer or a cow farmer? So like playing would you rather, but also just making these fun collages. So like we have a collage of lots of ancestors wedding pictures and it's fun to compare their dresses, their flowers, what decorations were there, what bridesmaids looked like. So that's just an interactive activities. Also having maps is fun. So I have a huge map of the world that's laminated and I've done several activities with it. And one of them was I printed all these pictures of ancestors of different places they had uh, served missions for our church. And I put little stickers, just little circle stickers all over the world and I handed out pictures of the ancestors and I said like clues to where they had served their missions. And so uh, then the kid would think like, okay, it's near an ocean or it's really near the north where it's cold. And they'd see a dot on the map and then put the ancestors picture on that dot. So it was like a geography ancestor matching guessing game. And that was really fun and interactive. And then we had that map hanging for a long time with those pictures on it and we would tell stories that we knew from their experiences on their missions and that was great um another fun activity i just love doing things with music we have a very musical family and one of the most powerful experiences i've had is when we've learned we found one of my grandfather's playlists of songs he used to play for dances play on his piano and we learned those songs and as a family we got together with cousins and siblings and aunts and we played this music and we felt so connected to him and because it's these old jazz songs that we don't hear anymore it helped us connect with you know a time long ago and helped us experience what he did so all of um so all these, I mean, I could go on forever. You could also, you, I have so many more activities in my book, uh, Turning Little Hearts, over 90 activities to connect children with their ancestors. There's games, there's um, things that you experience, crafts you can make. They all involve telling a story or a fact about an ancestor and then doing something hands-on to make that story more real or to recreate something or to make something that you can, you know, always remember that ancestor with. Oh, I just love that. And I, I too uh, love the music part. We're very musical here. And my husband's oh, yeah. grandfather was a musician. So I've been digging up the old sheet music at the Library of Congress to find music from 1910, you know, to be able to play. So, you know, it's it's just wonderful to, to hear that there's something for everybody I can't help but think when you have keepsakes and mementos that come out of these activities that that actually becomes the next generation inspiration. When your child becomes an adult, they have a child. That's something they're going to want to share willingly, I would think, uh, with their children as well. So you mentioned your your website and your blog. It's turninglittlehearts.com. And there you will find uh, Charlotte and her husband and the kids and you'll also get tremendous ideas in the blog, plus find Charlotte's books. And uh, these just look so inviting and fun. I'm guessing these are pretty, like you can just jump right into them, right? Yeah, well, the Turning Little Hearts book is an activity book. So it's full of all these templates. These re It's really cute. You can color them. You can write in the book. And yes, it's that keepsake. We, uh, we go to Roots Tech the past few years to so many grandparents that we sell them to. And we say, keep this book at your house. Mm -hmm. And when your grandkids come, do an activity with them and, and take a picture of the activity, print the picture, put it in the book. 
And then whenever they come, you have an activity prepared and an ancestor story to share. And then over the years, they'll have this book that's full of these activities that you've done together and they can remember them. I love what you said earlier about commenting that it's these intergenerational activities. Mm -hmm. So often when three generations get together, the grandparents and the parents chat and the kids are off playing. And I love these ancestor activities because it's a moment in these get togethers where all the generations are united doing something special, fun, and powerful together. Not just in the same house, not just at the same <laughs> property and the kids running around, but completely together. I love it. There's so much power in these ancestor activities. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte, for sharing all these wonderful ideas. And everybody listening, I will have a link over to turninglittlehearts.com in the show notes. Thanks again, Charlotte. Thank you very much for having me on. Well, it's time to stop by the editor's desk. And today we are talking to the editor of Family Tree Magazine, Andrew Cook. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Lisa. Hey, I know the September, October issue of the magazine is hitting the newsstands and our mailboxes pretty soon. So uh, what can we look forward to reading about in this issue? We've got a pretty well-balanced issue, if I do say so myself, this time coming around. Our cover story is on getting back to the basics on using family trees on Ancestry.com. So if you're among the millions and millions of people who have your family tree there, you can learn how to make the most of key features such as the gallery life story, which takes your ancestors' biographical details and turns them into a more narrative format. And of course, the main facts page where you can add uh, different sources and facts, uh, both those from Ancestry.com and those that you upload yourself. Uh, The article will also cover record hints, which is a popular tool. If uh, a little bit, I don't know, controversial maybe sometimes that, you know, people accepting hints that maybe they shouldn't or, yeah. uh, you know, so we, we talk a little bit about how to vet those record hints. And uh, it's by Gina Philbert Ortega, who teaches our Ancestry.com course. Excellent. You know, that's a good point. They're really valuable as long as we're vetting them. So it's nice to know that she's going to help us walk through that. And I know you work on so many articles and I know you're always picking up wonderful hints. What's some of the favorite tips you've come up with out of this issue? So Gina's article reminded me that there's no limit, at least as far as we know, on how many trees you can operate in Ancestry.com. So uh, one takeaway for me was that you can create multiple trees for different purposes. So uh, if you're researching just your maternal line or just your paternal line to have a more manageable sized family tree, you can just create a new one. (laughs) And that's something that I know you've talked about before, too, is having a master tree that you have on your local desktop and then only creating online trees for specific purposes, like connecting with DNA cousins or um, as that cousin bait. So trying to attract other users who might be online with the information that you've found and published. Absolutely. Anything else that we should be keeping our eyes out for in this issue? Yep. Our other feature articles are on German church records, how U.S. censuses can be misleading, uh, how to research your ancestors' middle names, and a timeline of U.S. immigration laws throughout history. Valuable uh, social history for people with immigrant ancestors. Well, terrific. Everybody listening is going to find all of this in the September-October issue. I think I'm intrigued. I'm I'm looking forward to reading uh, what might be in the U.S. census that's misleading. You guys always have thought-provoking articles, so we'll look forward to that in the new issue. Thank you so much, Andrew. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast, the show from America's number one genealogy magazine. I'll have the links and details for everything we talked about in our show notes. You will find those at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And don't forget, as Rachel mentioned, sign up for the free newsletter. It's a wonderful way to stay in touch with everything genealogy. I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and uh, be sure and check out the Lisa's Picks column in each issue of Family Tree Magazine, and you can come visit me over at my website, genealogygems.com. Until next time, have fun climbing your family tree. <laughs>